Evening and welcome to the first Parent Guardian Workshop of the 2022-2023 school year. Um, my name is Rebecca Cook and I'm a counselor with the CBSD Breakthrough Student Assistance Program. Um, I'm going to ask our translator, Maria Melendez, to share how to access translation for those who may need it. Buenas tardes, gracias por estar aquí con nosotros. Este es nuestro primer um, intervención que tenemos esta tarde. Si ustedes desean interpretación en español, por favor, puchar el globo y puchar en español y van a poder estar conmigo y van a escuchar toda esta presentación en español. Thank you, Maria. Um, Breakthrough and the Canadian Schools Foundation are excited to welcome CBSD's mental health coordinator, Dr. Heather Chamberlain, um, senior mental health clinician, Jennifer Mundy, lead elementary counselor, Katie Berry, lead secondary counselor, Emily Nelson, and breakthrough counselor, Brenda Rachels, here tonight to provide an overview of mental health resources available to all CVUSD students. If any questions arise during the presentation, please enter them in the Q&A box and we'll be answering them during the Q&A portion at the end of the presentation. We will do our best to get to as many questions as possible. Um, and then just, I, I know there's already a question about this. This evening's webinar will be recorded and will be posted on the Conejo USD YouTube channel. And so I will turn it over to Dr. Chamberlain to start us off. Good evening, everyone. I'm so happy to be here with you tonight. I feel like it's not very often that I get to be spend time with the parents and guardians of our community. And I just wanted to uh, talk a little bit about just some of the things that I see going on in our district and um, just some of some express some gratitude. Um, CDUSD leadership has been really supportive of us um, expanding programs that support the social emotional well being of our kids and the mental health of our students. And to that end, there are several programs that have been implemented that will be highlighted tonight. Um, I am grateful that you are all here tonight, that you um, have taken time out of your busy schedules to spend this, this hour with us. And I'm mostly grateful to our students who are going to school during a time that is so much different than when we were all in school and for all that they teach us every single day. Um, so today, we just are going to spend a little bit of time talking about what the district is offering and hopefully give you some strategies that you can use to work with your students. So normally in one of these presentations, I would go through and list a whole bunch of data that is sad and is um, sometimes even alarming about the state of mental health. I've decided to take a little bit of a different approach tonight. Um, we know that for the past 10 or 15 years, youth mental health has been declining, not only in the US, but globally. So in the US, one in three teens at this point experiences um, an anxiety disorder. Um, we know that depression is also very prevalent among our youth. And there was a resource that was released last January by our Surgeon General. It's called Protecting Youth Mental Health. And it's a resource that I think really lays out the problem of youth mental health and solutions to youth mental health from really a systemic viewpoint. And so I'm going to be sharing just a little bit about what our Surgeon General it has identified um, through tons of research. This is a free resource. Again, it's the Surgeon General's report, Protecting Youth Mental Health. And it lays out um, just a lot of really good information in an easy to read fashion about what is contributing to our kids' mental health and what we can all do as a community to support our students. One, actually there's two quotes that I'd like to just read out of that report. One is um, that our Surgeon General said, it would be a tragedy if we beat back one public health crisis only to allow another to grow in its place. And he was referencing youth mental health. And then he went on to say, ensuring healthy children and families will take an all of society effort, including policy, institutional and individual changes in how we view and prioritize mental health. 
we all can take a role in supporting our kids. We all can take a role in helping prevent this. And according to our Surgeon General, it's going to take all of us as a community to really work with, through, through this issue for a lot of our kids. So mental health is complicated, as many of us know. Um, sometimes I like to think of it as a perfect storm where just there's a co-occurrence of events that really just happens and kids are struggling. Um, it can have, it can be, um, you know, individual factors. It can be genetic. It can, um, we know our students, our LGBTQ plus youth really um, experience mental health challenges at a higher rate than um, our other students. Um, we know that sometimes families are just super stressed. Lots is, has been happening over these last few years, especially. Um, so there's issues around um, jobs. There's, um, we are taking on increasingly um, the roles of caregivers for family members, you know, and really um, trying to support other families in our community, our friends. Um, we know that the community can play a role in this. And I think this is where we are so fortunate to live in a, a really safe community um, where we have really strong um, partnerships with law enforcement and where we can, um, you know, have lots of opportunities to get out into nature and to, um, you know, exercise and do all of these things that really can boost your mood. Then there's environmental factors that we may have a little less control over, right? So sometimes environmental factors, the way I look at this, it can be like some of the things that we're exposed to just in what's happening in our world. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a minute. And then there's um, societal factors. We know that you know mental health is a difficult issue for a lot of people to talk about. I think that um, we're seeing um, increasing understanding about it, but I do know that we have a lot of work to do because it's not an easy topic to talk about and people, you know, have concerns about talking about feeling depressed or feeling anxious. Um, there is some stigma attached to it. And so it is a little bit difficult sometimes for some of us to really take on this issue. So what is contributing? to the complexity of youth mental health. And this is all laid out in the Surgeon General's report. First is the increased use of digital and social media. And there's a researcher who's been researching um, the role of social media in particular on youth mental health since the iPhone was released. And there's, she's, her last name is Twangi. Um, she's out of San Diego State University, I believe. But we know that this, it has, there's research increasingly linking to um, the use of digital and social media um, to the declining mental health in our kids. We also know that our kids are experiencing increased pressure and competition um, in schools. We know that our mental health system is really inadequate to meet all of the needs that we have right now. Um, I think that that was one really beneficial um, situation that came out of the COVID-19 is really there was a light shown on where our systems need to be bolstered up due to the increasing mental health needs in our country. We have health risk behaviors, financial concerns, um, socially economic disadvantaged households, when our households are stressed because someone has lost a job or, um, you know, somebody, something has catastrophic has happened that creates financial stress, that adds to our, our stresses and our ability to cope. Um, the other point that I, I like to spend a little bit of time on is climate change, because um, it sometimes feels like it's like this outlier We've known for several years that climate change is affecting student, our kids' mental health. And so one thing that I hear a lot from our kids is that unpredictability of their future, not knowing what the future is gonna look like. Um, and sometimes we need to just turn off the news for a little bit and take a little break from it. We have access to so much information and it really can overload our brains as adults 
And so think about how much that can overload our kids. And then COVID-19 just sort of set some of these people who were, you know, managing pretty well, uh, just kind of set them over the edge in terms of just uh, what was occurring in, in ter um, with being isolated and not having the same systems of support um, in place that they were that we're normally used to having. So mental health from a systemic lens requires all of us to take a role. And it's really important to know that we all can do something about this. It's important that our youth know and our families know how to recognize when something's off, what are the symptoms? What are the signs that I might be headed in a, a, in a, in a direction that isn't healthy or that isn't safe for me? Um, we need to remember that when we go through difficult times, there are often lessons that we can learn and take with us um, after those situations. A multi-systemic approach means that not one entity is going to be able to solve this problem. So families aren't gonna be able to solve this problem on their own. Schools aren't gonna be able to solve this problem on their own. Our community mental health centers aren't going to be. It's going to take all of us working together and chipping away at this problem and doing what we can within our sphere of influence to support our kids and to intervene on their behalf. One other thing, oh, sorry. Just wanted to make note of one other thing that, that is really important and that is timely um, collection of data. And one thing that we are really, um, really so, um, doing in our district is really collecting data that we need that gives us a picture of what student needs are so that we can tailor our supports and interventions to meet those needs. If you know we take three years to research what's happening with students, then our, already our interventions are outdated because mental health is such a dynamic, ever-changing issue. Okay, so a systemic response means that all of us take action. Our young people, our families, our parents and guardians, schools, our healthcare organizations, our community and media organizations. In the Surgeon General's report, and I know I keep bringing that up, but um, there's a whole section on just what, what we need to do in terms of social media and keeping our kids healthy, what parents need to do, but also what some of the social media companies need to start doing um, to support youth mental health, um, employers and government agencies at all levels. Is this my last one? So one way that we conceptualize the way we intervene with students in our district is through what we call a multi-tiered system of support. So what, and we're gonna to touch on this again a little bit later in the presentation. But in a nutshell, we basically divide the needs of students into three tiers. So tier one is a intervention or a support or a practice that would be geared towards all students. So an example of this might be, um, you know, a mental health education event held during lunch at school. We want all students to have the opportunity to get this information. We want all students to know where they can go for help. Um, so that would be an example of a tier one. Um, I'm so proud of our district. This year we have um, social emotional learning lessons happening in every single classroom. And so all of our students are getting support. And really what those lessons are geared toward is connection, how to, how to feel connected to your community, how to feel connected to your school and where to go if something happens and you feel like you need additional support. Tier two interventions are for students that may be at some risk or might just be going through a difficult situation or season in their lives. And one way to think about these is it's pulling together a small group of students and really working through something. So an example of this might be, um, you know, students who have experienced a, a loss and they just need a little extra help getting through the grieving process. 
And then our tier three are more individualized services. And those are for our students who are really struggling and really at risk. And so those services would look like regular meetings um, once a week with one of our mental health clinicians, right? So really um, giving students um, some, some really more intensive um, attention and intervention um, to help them um, you know, get where they need to go. Maybe that's connecting them to another resource or maybe it's just really working on and practicing some good coping skills, some communication skills, things like that. So I am going to hand this off to Jennifer Mundy who um, is amazing and I'm sure not a stranger to any of you because she speaks frequently um, for Breakthrough and is often um, one of our most popular speakers. And she'll be discussing a little more um, specific data in how you can support your students and especially in the area of anxiety. Hi, everybody. It's nice to be together again. So we're going to be talking about strategies to support your student that may be a little bit nervous in returning to school, may just be nervous in general. So one of the things anxiety does is it encourages us to avoid. And so when we feel anxious, we avoid. And if we can keep this in the back of our minds, the only thing to avoid is avoidance it's, itself. It will help us um, as we try to tackle anxiety. Avoiding anxiety feels really good in the short term. When something happens that makes us anxious and we avoid that thing, we immediately feel better. In the long term, the bummer is that we have actually made our anxiety grow a little bit more. So when we can learn about anxiety and learn how to take tiny steps forward, what we do is we learn how to shrink our anxiety and have more control over it. So this little friend here has a little gremlin uh, anxiety monster hanging out with him. And this little monster is giving him thoughts that are not particularly helpful. Most of us have had these thoughts at some point. And particularly if you're an anxious student at a new school or you're um, starting um, a new grade or whatever may be going on, you might be having some of these feelings or some of these thoughts. So students are often thinking, no one's gonna like you. You won't know where to go. What if your teacher is mean? Everyone's gonna laugh at you. You're gonna throw up in front of the whole class. I don't know. So it must be terrible. And what if I don't know how to get to the class? Um, if you remember going from elementary to mil middle school or junior high, you remember, oh my gosh, I'm going to have to learn how to use a locker and how scary that is in the beginning. So when we have these negative, really icky thoughts, it does something to our body and we start to feel terrible, actually physically feel terrible. We might feel nauseous, we might have a stomach ache, we might get a headache sweaty, all kinds of really unpleasant symptoms. And when we feel that way, sometimes we say like, oh gosh, I don't feel good. I have to stay home. We go to the next slide. And so our friend stayed home from school and he says, oh gosh, I feel so much better. But if you notice the little anxiety that was on his shoulder telling him little voices, little things is now bigger and saying, see, I was right. You're only safe at home. You should never go back to school. You should stay right there. Okay, next slide. So we're gonna talk a little bit about teaching students the power of their thoughts and how they can kind of move from those negative thoughts to more positive or realistic thoughts. So thoughts we think of as things that just sort of sneak up on us. They they uh, are sorry, feelings, they, they just sneak up on us. All of a sudden we feel anxious. All of a sudden we feel a certain way, but actually they're usually connected to a thought and the thought comes first. Um, so when we can kind of figure out how that works, it gives us a better chance at changing the way we feel and changing the way we act. So this is the cognitive triangle. It's how we explain how our thoughts 
feelings and behaviors are connected. So I have a sample with my little spider friend here, um, which many of us feel very nervous about spiders. Uh, so if the thing that you're thinking about spiders is, spiders are scary, terrible, and frightening, and they're trying to get me. If that's your thought, then if you follow that arrow down to where it says feelings and body sensations, the things that might be connected to that thought would be that you feel scared, you have a racing heart, you might feel jumpy, anxious, nervous, fearful, icky. And then if you go across the bottom to the other side, those feelings might cause you to have a behavior or an action like jumping on the table, screaming, freaking out, maybe doing something that feels embarrassing. So if you'll go to the next slide, we still have a spider here, but if you notice, the thought is different. So we've maybe worked with this student who is feeling very nervous about spiders, and they've learned that spiders are tiny, most are harmless, they are more afraid of me than I am of them. And when they practice that, and they've had that thought for a while, they feel a little more calm, more in control, more confident, they might even feel brave. And if they should see a spider, then they will do something very different. They might ignore the spider and keep moving on their way. They might squish the spider. So changing the way we think about something can change the outcome. If you'll go to the next slide. So here's an example using that same cognitive triangle, but looking at how our thoughts, feelings, and behaviors may be affected in a social setting. So this is so common in uh, students in school at all levels, they might be thinking to themselves, everyone's going to think I'm weird, no one's going to like me. And then the feeling that they have is nervous, self-conscious, paranoid, sad, lonely, upset. And then their behavior is that they might actually look down. They might avoid making eye contact. They might kind of avoid people because they're thinking everyone thinks that they're weird. And when we have that kind of nonverbal communication, People do avoid us because they think, oh, she doesn't want to hang out with me. She doesn't want to talk to me. I'll just move along. So if you'll go to the next slide. So one of the things that we do with students frequently is we talk to them about their thoughts. And so we might encourage them to think something a little bit different. So instead of everyone is going to think I'm weird, we might encourage them to think everyone's feeling a little a bit nervous, just like me. I'm likable. I have a lot to offer. And if they think that, they might feel nervous, but not alone, self-conscious maybe, but also self-assured and somewhat courageous, and they will still be breathing. And then their action might be that they're, they smile, they have some more friendly nonverbal communication, they're more open, and they might actually begin to make, um, make some little connections. So here's some strategies to help your student as they're trying to figure out this school year uh, and dealing with some anxiety. So anytime you can make anything visual, it will help students, particularly young students. If you'll go to the next slide. In that top corner there, you'll see um, a sample that says my afternoon schedule. And it has all the things that this child needs to do in the afternoon, and there's little um, stickers that they can move back and forth to signify that they've done that thing. So it's a good reminder, the parent isn't having to say it, and the student can get their things done. There's also one in the bottom corner that says, don't forget to bring your, and it goes on the door as the, uh, where the, the student would leave in the morning, and it says, don't forget to bring your water bottle, your lunch, your backpack, whatever it is that they need to bring that day. And then the other one is obvious, a, a phone or a device for our older students so that they can um, help keep track of their assignments and when they need to study and when their practices and those kinds of things are. And um, the positive about that is that there's ways to set reminders that could remind you of what it is that you need to get done the day before, 15 minutes before, um, so on and so forth. Okay. So when we're not feeling upset, it's a great time to start thinking about what works when we are upset. Once we're upset, we kind of need to calm down. But when we're in a calm place, make a list of what works. What makes you feel calm? What makes you feel better when you're not feeling um, great, when you're feeling nervous, when you're feeling a little bit sad or blue? So if you'll go to the next slide. 
here is a list of various things. There are a million more than this, but your student could write a list of things so that the next time they feel anxious, they feel sad, they feel depressed, they have a list of things that can help them. So this is just a sample, but they'll um, certainly have plenty of their own. Okay, thanks. Hi everyone, I wanted to um, share a little bit about what school counseling looks like um, here in CVUSD. So we are lucky we have counselors at every school site, um, elementary, middle, and high school. And we all take this real holistic approach to our students so that we are looking not just at one area um, like academics, but also social emotional and um, we are infus infusing that social emotional support across everything we do with students, whether that's one-on-one um, -on -one work or classroom lessons or um, just talking with them in the hallways. As you can see on this multi-tiered, multi-domain system of support here on the right-hand side, as Dr. Chamberlain had mentioned earlier, we're working through tiers or levels with our students. So at tier one, we're providing that holistic support for all students at the school site. Then we're utilizing our data to identify students who have an additional need and elevating them to a tier level two of support. And then furthermore, using the data to find students who need even a little bit more and then accessing additional resources that are available, providing individual counseling and getting them the support that they need to be able to be academically and mentally successful while they're a CBUSD student. So I would like to share what it looks like at el the elementary level. Um, we have six counselors at the elementary level. We have multiple school sites, but we all work very collaboratively collaboratively together. Um, we also have one social worker and uh, she is amazing. She helps a lot with students and also families. So there's that great family connection that we can get help with should we need it. Uh, one of the ways that we su provide support that tier one, everyone will receive it. Uh, we do assemblies with our students um, and their multiple still skills are being targeted, and, and that's an ongoing thing. If anybody has had a student come home talking about Kelso's choices and conflict resolution, that's what we were talking about this month. Um, we also provide classroom lessons, so these will build off the skills that were worked on or uh, introduced in assemblies, and it's a smaller setting to practice those skills. And those are ongoing, but also as needed. Sometimes it's just a pop-up classroom lesson and we're able to do that. We also work in small groups. So this is when students need a little bit extra support, um, a little bit of extra practice using those skills. And those groups can be built around what students need. Um, it, sometimes it's newcomers to the schools who need to make connections and build community within their school site. Sometimes it's just working on um, executive functioning skills where we're just learning how to organize and that kind of thing. Sometimes it's friendship skills and we are practicing that in a smaller setting. Um, there's also one-on-one -on -one counseling. So for students who need that extra little um, support system, um, maybe someone who also went through small groups, but has one little area to keep working on. Um, both small groups and one-on-one -on -one counseling are more short-term. And then, oh, again, the uh, we have SEL classroom lessons where multiple topics that we go over. So sometimes it's a pop-up, like I said, sometimes it's a lesson on growth mindset. Sometimes it's a lesson on manners, but we, we try to cover um, a lot of things to help kids in every way possible. We are very fortunate to have 29 secondary school counselors in CBUSD. So the secondary schools are going to include our middle schools and our high schools. We have nine middle school counselors between Kalina, Los Cerritos, Redwood, Sequoia, Sycamore. And we have 20 high school counselors at our five high school sites, Westlake High School, Thousand Oaks, Newberry, Century, and Conejo Valley High. 
As you can see from some of the examples on this slide, we do try to diversify our offerings. And we also try to infuse a lot of social emotional support into, <clears throat> into academic and college and career arenas. So as you're looking through the list of programming that we do provide here, you might see something like the first presentation, the college admissions decision. And you're thinking, well, that doesn't sound very social emotional or mental health related, but the truth of the matter is that applying to colleges and thinking about the future and transitioning out of the only school system that you've ever known is a very, very stressful process for not only our families and students, um, our students and our families as well. So we provided an assembly at Westlake High School last spring as admissions decisions were rolling out to help navigate those big feelings around the transition outside of high school. And I think that's a perfect example of how we really interweave the three domains of academic, social, emotional, and college and career. Um, on the right-hand side, you can see an example of some of the most recent small groups that are being run and have been run. So a girls empowerment group might work on self-esteem growth in a group of students that data has shown need a little bit of extra support. That school success group might focus on executive functioning skills. So if a student is not reaching their potential academically, we're gonna talk about self-esteem just as much as we're gonna talk about study skills. We do all of this work through the disaggregation of data. So while we rely on our entire school community to keep an eye on students, we're also surveying students to see where their challenges may be and then creating our programming around their needs. And sometimes, even though we have all this fantastic programming, the student just needs to stop by and talk to somebody. And that's what we are there for as well. We have daily open office hours and we're available all day, every day on some level for students to just pop in if they're having a rough time. And we'll work with them one-on-one -on -one in that moment to de-escalate and bring them to a place of calm and try to get them back into the classroom so they can finish their day on a high note. And if they do need a little bit more support beyond that point, then we can either connect them with resources that we have here at the school, including the school counselors, or local community resources that can give them that little bit of extra that they need to feel good on campus. Okay, so the Breakthrough Student Assistance Program is an additional layer of support, you know, in addition to everything that Emily and Katie just shared, um, that's available to all CVSD students kindergarten through 12th grade. Um, students may be referred to Breakthrough uh, as a Tier 2 intervention um, if they would benefit from support in addition to Tier 1 and Tier 2, inter, you know, supports that are already in place at the school site. Um, also, per board policy, Breakthrough is offered as a resource for any student who's been suspended for alcohol, marijuana, other drugs, and or violence. Uh, referrals are most often made by school counselors and school administrators as they're really aware of um, what resources have already been put in place for students at the school sites um, and, and making sure that they are connected to resources, you know, where students are on campus every day. Um, however, students and parents or guardians can also self-refer to Breakthrough. Um, any family that participates uh, will start with a 90-minute family conference or that long um, acronym, BRIM. Um, and it, what it includes is um, it's really a structured uh, interview that helps us to identify strengths, you know, that individual strengths for the student, as well as family strengths and any areas of concern. Uh, at the end of the meeting, the um, student, parent guardian, and the breakthrough counselor will collaboratively uh, come up with a plan that really spells out what each party is willing to do in order to help the student have a safe and successful rest of their school year. This may include individual or group counseling meetings uh, with the breakthrough counselor. Um, it also may include some resources at the school sites, you know, connecting families back to resources at the school sites that they may not have been aware of, as well as resources within our community. So Breakthrough kind of acts as a bridge between families and resources. Um, I am going to turn it over to Jen to talk about our wellness centers. Thank you. So our wellness centers are offering um, at our high schools, 
classroom presentations, workshops, small groups, individual counseling and walk-in support. And we have a modified version of these uh, wellness centers at our middle schools. So students can request to speak with a, a wellness counselor by um, talking to their school counselor, uh, to a teacher, they can walk in and they can also use these QR codes. Um, so we have a QR code here for Century, for Canal Valley High School, for Newberry, and Thousand Oaks, and Westlake. So they can use that QR code to um, access the wellness center or access their wellness counselor. So let's talk a little bit about tips to find the right support for your child. These are some ideas of when you should consider seeking help. If your child is withdrawing from social activities, there's self-harm, if they become more out of control or there's risk-taking behaviors, um, if they're having kind of sad uh, feelings that last more than two weeks, if they're feeling overwhelmed kind of suddenly, if there's changes in their eating or sleeping that are going on for uh, multiple days, mood swings, if you're noticing drug and alcohol use, any kind of drastic changes in their behavior or personality, and difficulty concentrating or sitting still. Um, I'm gonna add one to this list, and that is your gut instinct. As a parent, if you're feeling something is off, uh, check it out. Trust your gut if you're feeling something is off. So where can you find help? Um, if you have a physician or a pediatrician that you trust, you can ask them. If you have a friend who has uh, a therapist that they like or has their own child in, um, involved in therapy and uh, you trust their opinion, that's a great way to find a, a referral to a licensed uh, clinician. You can look on the website Psychology Today for a list of licensed providers. You can also call your insurance company and see who they'll cover, which is helpful. Uh, in, in addition to that, you can talk to the folks at your child's school. So their teacher, their school counselor, or another trusted person at the school. Once you have the counselor on the phone or the therapist on the phone or psychologist, whoever you're talking to, Here's a list of questions that can be helpful. Usually a clinician will give you about um, 15 or so minutes on the phone so you can kind of get a feel for them and they can kind of hear what your situation is and see if it's a right, the right fit for them. Um, but these questions can help you determine if this therapist that you're speaking with on the phone seems to be uh, somebody that would work well with your child or your family. So you may want to um, ask, them about what you could expect in the first session, how they work with children. If you have very young children, I would want to know how are you going to engage my child? How are you going to engage a young child in the therapeutic experience? Um, you can ask them how long they anticipate the therapy may take um, if they've worked with other people that have similar issues. So lots of questions here for you to consider as well as the questions that you might already have. This is a list here of really important phone numbers. Um, these are all on the CBUSD website, so you can access them. Uh, and if you have young children, then probably stuck on your refrigerator right now or somewhere pinned somewhere is a list of important phone numbers that you um, like to have in case there's an emergency. It might have 911 right at the top. It might have poison control or other um, hotlines that are important when you have young children. These are those kinds of phone numbers. So the crisis team, the suicide prevention hotline, the crisis text line, um, the youth crisis line, these are really great phone numbers to have. Um, put them in your cell phone, save them, because if it isn't your own child that, that needs them, it could be somebody else's child. And when we place these resources and familiarize ourselves with them, um, it sends a message to our kids that if they're having a need, if they're having a mental health um, uh, situation or a crisis, that there are places that we go for that. 
Uh, additionally, there is a new phone number that you should be aware of called 988. And 988 is fantastic. The service at the end of the line when you call 988 is not new, but the phone number is new. So instead of having to remember 1-800, blah, 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 all you have to do is dial 988 and it gets you right there. Um, and they can help you if you're having um, a mental health issue or a mental health crisis. I heard the other day um, that in 95% of the calls that they receive, they are able to de-escalate and calm the person down. That is a really, really high number. So lots of trained crisis counselors are um, manning that phone line 24-7. Okay. So you want to talk to your student about what to look for and where they can go for help. And really uh, important is to encourage your students to have other adults or safe people that they can talk to other than you. Um, oftentimes, students, uh, children feel um, a certain feeling and they don't want to share it with their parent because they're afraid to hurt their parent or they're afraid to burden their parent. So it's great if you have aunts, uncles, coaches, neighbors, friends, other safe adults that you can let your child know if you're struggling with something, you can always come to me. And you can always go to uncle so-and-so or aunt so-and-so or your coach, your neighbor, your friend, your teacher, your school counselor, lots of people to help bolster that um, social emotional support for our students. Thank you, Jen. And we did it at the end. <laughs> Thank you, Jen. Um, we're going to move into the Q&A session now. And uh, we had a lot of questions that were submitted upon registration of this event, but we have the Q&A open as well right now. So if you have any questions, feel free to submit it in the Q&A and we'll get through as many as possible. Um, so just starting off with the first one, we had someone write in um, whose child is a perfectionist and just any tips that you could give them on, on how to support them um, when they are wanting to do everything 100% correct. Mm -hmm. So when you're dealing with a student who is a perfectionist, um, that can be such a paralyzing, frustrating feeling. And what I would encourage you to do is um, seek out your school counselor, seek out the wellness counselor, talk to other or encourage your students to talk to other people. But as a parent, one thing that you can do is talk a lot about all the failures that you've had. Instead of focusing on, I am this in this fantastic position in my career and I have all of these successes, talk about all the times you blew it, all the times you tried something and you failed, you embarrassed yourself. Because that teaches our kids that it's really, really normal for everybody to screw it up sometimes and we still get back up and we try again. There's a great article um, called The CV of Failure and it's essentially a resume of failure. And I think it was a Harvard, a um, uh, talk was given where they had all of these professors that were like the top researchers in the field, but the topic of this uh, discussion was how did you fail? And all of these people who like have invented amazing things and cured things and all, it, they talked about all the ways that they screwed it up and they did it wrong and they did it wrong again and again and again until they finally got it right. And I think that kind of thing really helps um, people understand. Um, I would praise when our students are making an effort as, as opposed to getting a grade. If you, if you have a student that is like staying up until the middle of the night working on a project or studying and they take time to rest, praise the rest. Praise when they are finding joy in something, if they are doing something um, other than the perfectionistic behavior. Really put a lot of attention and energy into so great to see you prioritize yourself, your health, and your well-being. I love that you put the books down and you're, and you're taking time to chill out and whatever it is that they like to do. And I loved how you talked about 
looking at the that all of the failures because that's when we grow and just what you referring back to your cognitive triangle reframing like the failures are what teaches our lessons that help us get better so that's great um and then dr chamberlain had referenced uh part of the struggle with mental health too is that connection with the community and we've had that loss of connection within the school community with with COVID-19 so some of the parents have just have written in and talked about for kids that are might be a little more shy or introverted trying to get back into connecting with friends when kind of that avoidance um, that you were talking about as well has been really easy to just avoid being mm -hmm. in touch with people so any tips on getting their kids back out connecting with peers mm -hmm. um I think one thing that's important to remember is that our world is set up for extroverts. We, the, the, everything is set up to be an extrovert. If you're an introvert, the world isn't really set up for you. So if your child, it was an extrovert before the pandemic and then things shifted, we should probably look at dealing with an anxiety issue. If your child was an introvert and they're still an introvert, I would ask a few questions and find out, is my child actually unhappy or are they perfectly happy and they're introverts so they don't socialize the same way that I do. I'm an extrovert so I would lose my mind if I had to stay home all the time and and I didn't have interactions with other people but other people really enjoy that. That really fuels them and feeds them so I would pay attention to that a little bit. Just make sure that is it actually that my kid is struggling or is this kind of who they are and they're just fine. If they are struggling, there's lots of ways to help get them back in touch. Um, the Wellness Center offers different uh, wellness focused activities at lunchtime. So students can engage in those activities. They can play games, there's puzzles, lots of things to do to help connect them to um, other students in a more gentle kind of a way. Thank you. Um, so now we're on the other side of, of friendships and uh, connecting with peers. How about friendship drama, uh, especially middle school, high school, but you know, you do see that in elementary as well. Um, so any tips on that? Oh, I really don't want to answer this question because I hate friendship drama more than anything. It's so hard as a parent to see your child struggling to, um, to have friends or when there's friends that are um, talking behind their back or gossiping or whatever. Uh, what I would say is uh, if, if you are a parent and there is friend drama, keep breathing, take a step back, validate your child's experience by repeating what you're noticing. This is so hard to have lost this friend or to have your friend group exclude you in this way. This just feels terrible and you feel alone, and I'm, I'm so sorry that you're going through this, without jumping to, I cannot believe these students did this to these other kids. I'm good, like without marching over there. And I say that because that's what I want to do, and that's why I don't want to answer this question, because I just want to march over and make everybody get along. But that isn't typically the best idea. So I would say um, validate how your student is feeling. You can always reach out to the school if you think it's more than just friend drama. And um, try to help your student find uh, other students that they can um, connect with, other uh, activities at the school that they might be able to build friendships with. Um, if you're at a school that has a wellness center, you can... Um, we have kids all the time go in at lunchtime and say, we're, we're struggling, we're fighting, we're not getting along. And we'll do what's called a restorative conference or a restorative circle. And we will sit everyone down and we'll hash it out all together. That way it's mediated by somebody that's kind of a safe adult. I'm sure you could also visit the school counselor's office and let them know, hey, this is really um, bugging me that this this kid is doing that. And if you're in um, an elementary school grade, you can talk to um, somebody in the school office or your teacher if it's becoming more um, more of a problem. Um, another question is, parents are struggling to set screen time limits. We know our kids really want to be on their phones more than we would like them to be. 
Um, so that's one thing, but then how it can affect sleep um, and making sure that they're not on their phones and uh, not sneaking them. So any thoughts you have on not only managing the phone and screen time, but also any tips on, on getting enough sleep? Mm -hmm. Um, I think we're learning more and more how tremendously important sleep is, and we're just not getting enough of it. A hundred years ago, kids slept one and a half hours longer every day. So we are actually sleeping less than we used to. And part of the reason for that is because our brains are so confused because they're inundated with light all the time. And it happens to be this like bright, um, whatever they call it, blue light that is stimulating to the brain and tricks us into thinking that we should be awake, changes kind of the circadian rhythms or whatever we need for sleeping. Um, talk to your students, uh, your kids at home about screens and how they impact them. If there is one generation that is going to change things, it is the generation that is currently in our schools. This Gen Z generation is no joke. These kids are coming for us and they know what they're doing. And I think a lot of them are coming into the wellness center and they're talking about how they hate social media, how they're upset about their phones. They um, are challenging themselves to put the phone down or to turn it off or to delete the app or whatever. Um, so I think this generation that we're dealing with is the generation that's going to flip this on its head. If you want some strategies, there's two books that I think are so, so fantastic. One is by um, Manoush Zarodi, I think is the last name. The book is called Bored and Brilliant, but she actually had a podcast first. And then she it turned into a book. Um, so you could still read the or listen to the podcast. But she has these all this information about screens, social media and sleep, and um, how screens and social media are impacting our creativity. It's changing who we are as people, changing our brains. And she has these fantastic challenges. Um, one of them is called Take a Fake Vacation, like vacation, but vacation, where you um, have a set time of the day that you turn your phone off. And during that time, if you're on your vacation, and it allows your brain to just recuperate and not be inundated with um, information every second. And the other thing that she says to do is to challenge yourself. Um, and this really would be a challenge for me because I'm um, chronically checking my phone. Um, she says to, uh, stop checking on the go. So if you're in the elevator, waiting to go up in the elevator, if you're in between classes, like don't check it unless you're intentionally um, supposed to be on your device. Uh, the other fantastic book is uh, by a hilarious guy. It's such a great book. And it's called uh, Stolen Focus by Johan Hari, I think is the last name. It is fantastic. And if anybody wanted to put a book club together, I might show up. Um, he wrote a book all about how um, every time we pick up our phone and check social media, somebody earns money. It is a, a, it is a way for um, whoever it is, Facebook, TikTok, Instagram, somebody's getting paid. Um, and this is where I think the Gen Z folks are gonna switch this all up because they're wise to this and they're gonna flip all of that around. Um, and then the last thing that I think could potentially be uh, something that you could do um, is you can download an app or um, uh, get it off of the internet. There are different, um, I, I don't know exactly what they are, I'm not techy enough to know, but it changes the the, the light that comes out of your computer and and they can sometimes change gradually over the 24 hour period so it might be like bright light in the daytime and then as you get closer to night it gets more and more and more orange and it helps your brain understand that nighttime is coming um so i hope that was gave you some ideas about how to handle that yeah i liked your checking phone on the go i think as parents that's something that we could all probably work on and model for our children <laughs> So, yeah. um, 
Yeah, how about specific strategies um, in returning back to school? Just some good tips on students that um, have ADD and are feeling a little more challenged with just getting organized and focused mm -hmm. and still some of that leftover from the pandemic. Yeah, um, attentional issues are um, where our the front part of our brain is not as responsive as we would like it to be. And it looks different in all kinds of people. So what works for one student is going to be different than what works for another student. But typically, um, if you are a parent of a child who is dealing with an attention issue, you might find yourself saying over and over and over again, did you do this? Don't forget to do this. How about that? Did you do this? Don't forget you need this tomorrow. And you have like, so we're constantly reminding them, constantly telling them, and why are we doing that? Because we care, we love them, we want them to be successful. But what we're doing is actually preventing this part of their brain from um, developing and from being challenged. So one thing that parents can do when they are um, dealing with a student who has um, attention issues is um, take a deep breath before you lose your mind because it's not easy. And um, when you're feeling like, oh, my kid's not gonna remember that they need to do their project, it's due tomorrow. You can say, what do you need to do tonight so that you're successful tomorrow? So rather than telling them, get your project done by 5 p.m., don't forget you have to study for math. You have it at 8 a.m. Instead of doing that, you're saying, what do you need to do to be successful? You're helping them exercise that front part of their brain and, and be able to um, um, manage their attention a little bit further. And there's so many positive qualities of people that have ADHD. Um, we can really focus on phrasing those positive qualities, whether that's creativity or multitasking, or sometimes it's intense focus. Like some kids with ADHD focus so intensely, they can't switch from this to this. Um, and a lot of the most creative stuff that we have in the world comes from folks that uh, have ADHD. So it's not the end of the world. Yeah, so true. That's such a good reminder for parents. Um, how about managing emotions? So you did talk a little bit about making a list of what makes you feel calm, but even for parents, I mean, that's something that they can do. So when we got the, the emotions, um, hormones, teenagers mm -hmm. uh, going up and down, what are some other tools that we can talk about to help manage those big emotions? Yeah. So the emotions that you feel as an adult, whatever they are, mad, sad, glad, frustrated, uh, whatever it is, your child from zero on experiences the exact same emotion. It's the same. The difference is that as an older person, I have learned some skills so that I know how to handle some of those emotions. And our kids, they're just wide open. They're just doing their thing. So the emotion is the same, but the skill is different. Um, when we're trying to help kids with their big feelings, prevention is really the key. Once somebody has lost it and they're freaking out, whatever that looks like, it is not the time to say, oh, let me teach you the skill. Let's try some deep breathing. Have you tried meditating today? How about mindfulness? It, we're, we're past that point. But when we're calm, when we're feeling okay, that's the time for teaching. So um, there are on the internet 10 bajillion ways to learn how to calm down your feelings. Deep breathing, progressive um, uh, body relaxation, um, journaling, lots of ways to help calm your feelings down. Uh, we just need to teach our kids those things the same way that we teach them reading and writing and math and all of that other fantastic stuff. Okay, this is gonna be our last question of the evening. Okay. Uh, just kind of thinking going forward, how are there any tips for parents to help improve their child's self-esteem? That doesn't seem superficial to the child. I remember my child just saying, mom, you just say that because <laughs> you're my mom or you know, you're my dad. So what's something that's like authentic um, that can really help build our kids up without this uh, flattery that they feel like is you know, you know, not authentic. 
working. Yeah. Um, there is a, a thing called, um, because in education, we love our acronyms. It's called PDA. It stands for Positive Descriptive Acknowledgement. And PDA is super powerful and amazing. And essentially what you're doing is you see your kid doing something. Um, maybe it is they painted a painting at the easel in preschool or they're working on something, whatever it is, instead of saying, oh, good job, beautiful painting. You look beautiful. You did that so lovely. Instead of focusing on that, you're describing the thing that it is that they did. So it might be you worked so long on that project. It must have been really important to you. Tell me about your project. Or um, I saw you put all the toys away. That is so respectful. You really know how to take care of things in our house. Or um, uh, an example with this student that's a perfectionist, a way to PDA the perfectionist would be, um, you know, I noticed you put your books down and you pulled out your, um, your uh, book that you're just reading for pleasure. I really love seeing you um, engage with things that just matter to you, really taking time for yourself. So it's, it's a um, positive descriptive acknowledgement. And um, like so many of the things that I've already said, because we have such a short amount of time, you can Google it and it will give you lots of examples. So you could even have a script. Thank you, Jen. Um, I just a little reminder that this whole presentation will be posted on the Conejo USD YouTube channel in the next couple of days. And just want to thank everyone tonight, um, our CBSD school counselors and mental health staff, and specifically, Jen, you're always on point. Um, thank you for giving us so many tips on helping our children be successful um, as we're moving into the school year. And I also want to thank Maria Melendez for facilitating our translation this evening. Um, we also, also want to say thank you to all of our parents for attending tonight's event brought to you by the Caneo Schools Foundation and the Breakthrough Student Assistance Program. And we look forward to seeing you at upcoming events. Um, so have a good night and we'll see you next time. Thank you.